was a bit hard to translate the title of my talk because in Hungarian we literally say a castle made of cards, which illustrates more the thing that you are building a big structure of something that's not appropriate for it. But this talk is going to be about RFID and uh, if you are either an expert in RFID security or if you've listened to every RFID talk in the last five years on CCC and DEF CON then this talk is not for you and please stop wooing because this is going to be uh, targeted towards people who just don't know what the state of this is so yeah this is not going to be a really original research, this is going to be a talk for people who only know that they have RFID and don't know why it's really unsecure. So, yeah, here I am, German uh, line artist, and uh, the most important thing is that this small license, it's a hemorrhoidal license, and uh, the fun thing is that even though we have more and more devices every year which operate on radio waves, uh, less and less people want to know about it. Because if you get a license like this, you, this is the only way in most countries, including Hungary, so that you can operate your own devices without actually uh, trying to get a license for it. So you should get one, and uh, it's very interesting to, to experiment with devices like RFID. Yeah, this is a piece of rice next to an RFID chip that can be injected into, uh, well, objects, being living or, or not living. And uh, the problem is, uh, well, first of all, privacy. Yeah, if you don't recognize the gentleman, it's Richard M. Stallman, uh, founder of uh, FSF. And uh, yeah, he's, he's wrapped his RFID badge at this conference into aluminum foil. Uh, which is something I would recommend. So when I got my latest credit card from my bank, they had this PayPass thingy built in, and I responded to that uh, event by creating a small holder for it, which has aluminum foil, and it, it works great. I tried uh, lots of devices to talk to the card across the aluminum foil, and yeah, it uh, kind of didn't work, especially because RFID devices were, have their power supplied by the electromagnetic field. And if, if the aluminum foil uses up most of the electromagnetic field, the card doesn't even boot up. So here's how we do it. And our greatest device is at least six or seven years old. Uh, it's called Proxmark 3. And it was created uh, by a student doing his uh, master's degree. And, uh, the great thing is that it has a Spartan uh, device, it's an FPGA, Stefan already mentioned it. FPGAs are great because they are like a circuit in which you can update the, the elements of the circuit via software. So even though the project was made uh, seven years ago, people still uh, submit patches to it and improve on it because it's uh, free and open source software and hardware in this sense. It also has a cheap ARM processor, so actually you have a whole little operating system running on it and you can reconfigure it to do anything you want to do. It's like having an Ethernet device connected to an RFID antenna, so you can try to do things that, uh, for example, uh, suppliers of RFID devices will say that, oh yeah, we have this device, but you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, <coughs> do something bad with it because you need to know the key, you need to know the protocol, yeah, you can do the same stuff with this, but you don't have to to play by the rules set by the, by the guys designing it. And first, we, uh, I'd like to go into low frequency stuff, which is uh, in this frequency range, and this band is kind of unregulated. You have to be really close, and the band list is also really, really uh, small. So the thing is that most devices operating in this band have absolutely no security. The only security is based on the fact that you do not know the protocol or you do not have the hardware to play with. And in the software world, we've known since at least 10 or 20 years that this is no security. But in this case, we need the hardware to prove it. So. First of all, most of them use ASK. I've been really short about 
and stuff. ASCII means you modulate by having waves when the, byte, uh, the bit is 1 and no waves when it's 0. It's really simple, it's amplitude shift key by the way. And uh, uh, since you cannot have a separate channel for, for clocks, uh, the way you do it so that you don't uh, mess up, for example, 3 1 bits for 2 or 4 1 bits, you try to put the data, uh, the clock into the data, so you can have, you always have an up or down edge at every bit, even if it doesn't change. So that's how most of them work, and uh, once you could decode it, uh, well, that's where the bit hunt begins. It's like a big crossword puzzle where you try to match the numbers printed on an ID tag with the bits actually sent over the, the air. And uh, usually it takes a few trials and then you figure out, oh, that bit must be that bit and that's uh, always zero, that's always one and that looks like, uh, uh, how do you say it, a uh, parity bit. So it's, uh, it's a checksum, but only one bit wide. And in the end, you can figure out how it works, and I'm going to demonstrate with a simple garage trick. Uh, this is, of course, a controlled experiment, and do not try this at home. Try this at someone else's home. Um, <laughs> we are going to get into the garage first by using the legitimate uh, uh, he, this is a low frequency device, and uh, the guy driving the car is our CEO, so looks like he's a CEO who also does the job for us. Uh, yeah, that's the thing that uh, checks it, it flashes green, the uh, bar is open, so we go down, and I'm sitting in the uh, right seat with a notebook and the proxmark already booted up, so we try to find a place to park before you know start tinkering with the card. I try not to cue in it or spin it because otherwise you might say that oh I just cut the video and it's sorcery. And yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there there was the antenna and there's the proxmark. Beautiful little device and there's the antenna, the circular one. And here I just start the Proxmark client. It's a really simple command line uh, interface, but it has help, it has a wiki. And I put the real tag to it and uh, say that, please, I'd like to get some samples. And uh, yeah, that says read and H uh, specifies the, the bandwidth. And now I transmit the 4000 samples to the card, that's why the, the LED is lit. But actually, I only had to get the card there for this read command and the samples. They, that's just transmitting them from the Proxmark to the device. And then I open a menu called EM4X, that's the type of the card. And uh, I say EM read, and then it detects the clock grid and reads the hexadecimal ID, which is not visible, but you'll see it when I just copy paste it. Yeah. You see it there, so it's a numerical ID which is emitted all the time while the device is powered up. So it's, it's that fucking simple, you see there is no security. And then I say, okay, simulate this card. So now the Proxmark lights up its LED when it's got this uploaded and now it just transmits this ID over and over so it behaves like this tag and well, now we'll try to get out of the garage now using the clone tag. And the funny thing is that you, I could have said that I want to increment that ID, so now that I have full control over the contents, I could, for example, if I had a, uh, a card that lets me into one place but not another, I could try experiment with what, what bits control that kind of information. And, and it's mad, I mean, why don't they have some, some great Mac or something like that? So, so, IT security and computer world passed it like 10 years ago. It flashes green and we are left out. So, here's how you steal a car from a parking place like that. The opening the car part can be learned from the lockpicking guys. <laughs> I only show you this part. You know, we try to complement each other. <laughs> so, we go to the other part. High 
frequency. Uh, yes, this is called high frequency because when they named bands, they thought that this is high frequency. So now we have very high frequency, ultra high frequency, super high frequency, extremely high frequency. You see, that's the limits of science changing. And it's actually in an ISM band like Wi Fi and Bluetooth, so you don't actually need to have a license within certain power. power uh, settings, it has a higher range and it has better bandwidth and uh, this is actually the band in which Micro Classic operates which is really old story, everyone has heard about it, that it used a flowed cryptographic system called Crypto One which was their own designed crypto, that's one of the big rules, if someone says that we have our own crypto developed, that, that's a bad sign, you should run away really really fast. Uh, also, nuke it from space, that's another option. And uh, yeah, it was uh, put on by an anonymous poster of Google code, and then people uh, found a flow in it really fast. Yeah, it's a normal story. The problem is that even though it was broken, some people said that, oh, that's no problem. The first four bytes of the card is in a ROM, not a RAM. So if you, for example, take an HMAC based on that. Based on those four bytes, it will not be possible to duplicate the, bar, the card. Even you could, even though you could uh, overwrite and clone all bytes, those four bytes are untouchable. So that's where the Chinese guys came in, and it was uh, called Chinese card because it's orderable from China, but what's not? Uh, so they created a card which disobeys this part of the specifications and lets you overwrite even the four first bytes. So that's where you go into another domain and say that, okay, I have an NFC phone, it's a Nexus S, it has an NFC chip built into it, it's a four years old phone, it runs Android, Android can handle NFC via a real beautiful simple API, so I wrote a simple application that let me uh, increment one by one the, the code on a card, I got a guest card in a bank, and then I read all the data, the gas card was deactivated, and I used the same structure, started incrementing it, incrementing it, and it would write it into a blank uh, Chinese card. Then I touch it, and on the fourth trial it worked, and it let me into the building. And of course, this is also an OPSEC problem. Why do you have an entrance where you don't have a guard? But then again, it's like uh, Bruce Schneier said that he saw only one instance of a working biometric system. It had a guard with a gun next to the <laughs> reader, so if you tried something funky, he would shoot your head. Yeah, it was a marine, actually. It was a marine, sorry. <laughs> and yeah, RFID is great. You have passports, you have credit card, please try it. And uh, if you are from the area, please be in Crypto Nights. We have this event which Stefan started last year after his talk here, where we discuss uh, cryptographic uh, stuff like monthly. And thanks for your attention.